Well, hey, I'm Crystal Jodry, and I co-lead with my husband, Nathan. And today we are going to be doing a question, a Q&A. Um, so I'm going to introduce to you our panelists. You guys aren't in order. No. <laughs> So Nathan is the lead pastor of Ridgeline Church. Wave your hand. He has experience managing the finances of a nonprofit. Nathan has helped raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for ministries and nonprofits around the world. What is your favorite thing about me? Yeah. You could. <laughs> now that I have a mic, though, I can. Uh, no, I, my favorite, I don't know. I like your hair today. Thanks. It's good. All right. He put a funny question down that I didn't want to ask, so I threw him off. And next we have Tony Castro. Tony is the COO of the Evangelism Explosion International. He works with finances and a budget that affects the ministry around the world. I get intro music. Nice. Huh? <laughs> you have a theme song, Tony. Tony, how many countries um, do you guys minister to in EE? Wow. Well, we actually minister in every nation on earth, uh, even ones that are hard to get into, like North Korea. We have ministry going on there, but we have uh, deep established ministry in about 83 nations. Wow. Awesome. And then we have Kyle Henson. Uh, he is the agency manager of Buncombe County Farm Bureau. He helps people and families plan for a healthy financial future, foreseen and unforeseen. He is also on the Ridgeline Board of Trustees. Kyle, how many people a month do you think that you help on average? Me personally or my agency? Your agency. Okay, you. <laughs> Two. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good number. Obviously, at Ev and Flows, um, we probably take in at least 100 to 250 calls a day. So whatever wow. that equals out to. Um, we have about 6,500 members in my agency. So. Wow. Awesome. So the reason why we're doing this Q&A is because we are concluding our series, Big Gains. And we are looking at exchanging worldly riches for in eternal treasures. All right. So we are going to get into our questions. And this question came from Amber. I would like insight on how to put faith before fear where finances are concerned. When there is no money in the bank, how are some good ways or good scriptures to motivate you to continue to tithe and trust that God has your back financially? Great question. Wow, when the pastor hands off the mic for the first question, <laughs> nothing like going first. Do I get to keep no. passing it down? No. Well, um, a good first step to take... I have put in faith before fear. I, I think that's what it all comes down to, uh, putting faith before fear and, um, you know, trusting that God is bigger than our circumstances, whatever those might be. Um, you know, we, um, the, the practical application is what Nathan has talked about is uh, we give uh, a tithe, we give a tenth, and that's the first tenth. And when, so when we get our paycheck, when I get my paycheck, the first uh, the first bill, or it's not a bill, but of the expenses that is uh, paid is tithe. And it's a step of faith. And sometimes that is hard to do. Um, you know, sometimes it, it, giving is a spiritual discipline. And it, sometimes it has to start out that way. Just as a discipline, we do it because we have to do it and we're supposed to do it. Uh, but I know for me, by, by uh, give stepping out in faith and, and doing it because I knew I was supposed to do it and giving and, and tr testing God and trusting God in that way, I've seen him uh, bless abundantly. And there's been times early in our marriage and even before we were married in my, my, my uh, financial past, there was times where the dollars and cents didn't add up on paper. 
but I would give, and somehow, even though I couldn't make the math work on how I was going to pay everything with what was in my bank account, God somehow provided. Sometimes he did it miraculously. I just didn't, I don't know. Sometimes he gave me some income that I wasn't expecting, but it was because I stepped out in faith and, and gave that first 10% to God. And as I've done that, and I've seen God prove himself over and over again, uh, it has moved from being something I have to do to something I get to do. I get to invest in God's ministry. Does anybody have a scripture they want to share? Um, I was going to say the scripture that we talked about in week three, uh, this, the scripture of um, the widow uh, and Elijah, where she puts, um, where the widow puts Elijah first and, and gets her finances in biblical alignment. Um, but I was also going to say a couple of things. One, I think we need to ask God for a bigger view of who he is. Um, we say, God, like, I don't see how this works out uh, in the math, but you're, you're just so big and so credible anyway that you could make this work in an infinite amount of ways uh, on my behalf. And uh, like Tony was saying, I think it is, uh, I was going to say, almost like a muscle that you work out. And it becomes one of those things where, it, it, sure, the first week you go to the gym, the first month you go to the gym, whatever, it can be a little bit difficult. It can be a little bit, oh, I got to do this. Oh, I got to, you know, I got to get up early. I got to make sure I got to, and, and the same thing feels like that in your finances. Oh, we got to tighten up because we, you know, we used to have this extra 10% that we were used to spending. Now we're going to, we're going to prioritize our finances biblically and we're going to tithe. And, and so now we have to rearrange the budget or look at things a little bit differently. But, but as it becomes, but eventually it becomes, Comes easier and easier and easier. And um, I think one of the best things you can do as parents is just raise your kids that way. My parents raised me this way just to tithe. I, I've never not tithed. And so it's never been a challenge for me because it was the way I was grown up. And I don't mean that to undermine anybody who's just now starting and it feels like a challenge to them. I don't mean that in any way. But do your kids a favor in that sense and just train them up uh, to be givers and to be tithers. But um, but like Tony was saying as well, we had the, we've had in our marriage, we've had very similar situations where we always tithe first and then however the month plays out, the month plays out. And sometimes when uh, there is, we've had randomly where we're out of food and groceries show up on our doorstep. We've had those types of things where God has already preordained people to come in and step in at the right moment because we were being faithful, and, but yet we were still in need and he was providing for those needs in ways we could not have imagined. Nothing? The next question is from Kim, and Nathan, you're kind of rolled right into this one, is what are some practical ways to begin teaching kids about money at an early age? Practical ways. I can't answer my own wife's question. So. <laughs> <laughs> Say it. Practical ways to teach your kids about money. I think just what Pastor Nathan and Tony were saying is, is make sure you start out with the base to know that anything that comes into the house, um, the first 10% is the Lord's. And I truly believe if the first 10% is blessed, the 90% will be blessed. Um, I was actually talking to my oldest son yesterday because unfortunately his truck has blown up. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's in a different situation than we are as adults um, because he doesn't have a lot of money set aside for an emergency. But this is a good time for him to learn that life happens. So that means he's going to have to figure out what he's going to do with his vehicle. Um, I think setting up those safeguards and letting them fail in a safe way is good. But also realizing, you know, Riley's 17. He spent some money on his pit bike. That's okay. I'm not going to go play and spend money on pit bike that I don't have without having some some other things set in place. Yeah, some margin, exactly. Uh, but I think for kids, just showing them um, that you do need to start saving, that it's a good practice. Uh, and, and I think for adults or children, I am trying to teach our children to do it in a percentage base. Meaning, when Riley goes and he's waiting on tables, if he makes $100 a night, then put 10% to tithe put 10% in savings, put you know, money back, but do it percentage-wise because as he continues to grow and earn more money, it's not, oh, I'm saving 100 bucks. Well, you made $200, so you should put $20 back. You know? And as you continue to grow in that, it's just a good base. At least that's 
kind of what we're doing. I'll just, something I've been wrestling with a little bit, uh, I'm trying to teach my kids these principles that Kyle just mentioned, uh, and one of the ways I've, I've done that is um, through little um, electronic cash cards, they call them, for our kids, to, that kind of forces them, you could set a, a plan, a savings plan for, uh, for savings, for giving, and, and, but uh, what I'm kind of noticing is that when they don't see it, when they can't touch it and feel it, it's not a sacrifice. And so I've been contemplating that I need to um, probably get my kids used to handling cash so they have that sensation of I've received this and then I'm giving some back to the Lord. I'm, I'm making a sacrifice. I'm setting aside some to, to saving. So that's something I've been wrestling with as of late. Uh, it, it, when it's just all digital, it's just kind of out there. It, it's kind of ambiguous and there's not that sense of, of sacrifice to it. So, so. Uh, a couple of things I would say, Dave Ramsey has a, uh, a couple of financial books for kids specifically. And so, uh, of course, you, and I think they're more workbook style. And so you can run your kids through some of those things to help them have uh, understanding of basic financial terms like a budget, tithe, saving, you know, those types of things. Um, the other thing I would do, I think a lot of times, and especially if, you know, your parents were boomers or older, finances were so personal to them. Um, that maybe you grew up in a household where finances was never talked about. You don't, you didn't know how much money, money mom and dad had. You didn't know if you guys were poor or rich, or you just were living this way because mom and dad were hoarding so much or saving so much. You didn't know the real financial situation in your household. And so, uh, of course, you know, you don't tell the kids everything. Uh, like, you know, you just, uh, here's our credit card numbers. You know, like there's some wisdom in all of this. Uh, but I think what having open conversations with your kids about, hey, this is what we're doing in our finances this month. This is our goals. This is why we're transitioning from spending this way to spending that way. Uh, we, we celebrate it with our kids a couple of weeks ago, or it's been a little while now when we paid off Crystal's car finally, you know, and it was like, hey, this is a big moment for our family. We've, we have, we are completely debt free now because we're out from under this last uh, debt that we had a car payment. And so we take the opportunity to tell the kids, hey, this is a big deal for our family and bring them along in part of the process uh, in certain ways. So that way they become adults and they go, this is the first time I've ever had to think about finances because mom and dad never talked about them or mom and dad never showed me anything or I didn't learn it in school or I didn't learn it, you know, whatever. So it was really good. So the next question is from Mary. While making financial decisions, how do you know if you are being a good steward of your money and managing it God's way? Somebody's got to say something up here. (laughs) Well, I'm assuming the question means um, if you are, you're tithing and you're saving, with the rest of it, how do I know I'm being a good steward of, of the rest of it? Um, the um, uh, for me, I think that um, uh, we we first of all we budget not only for the give the, the the donating the tithe and the savings, but also how we're going to use the the, the other eighty percent of what's there. So I think just uh, prayerfully building a budget, having a spending plan. Um, one thing Kim and I have tried to do with, uh, you know, varying degrees of success over the years is give ourselves an allowance. So outside of the stuff that's necessary, uh, mortgage, you know, car payment, uh, electricity, stuff like that, food on the table, um, you know, we, um, you know, we set aside an allowance even for us, not just for the kids. So we know that we're going to, uh, if I want to go out to lunch or, you know, during the week, that that's coming out of, out of my allowance. So I'm not... Uh, living beyond my means. Um, and I think when we do that, when we're disciplined, I think that is uh, glorifying to God. That's uh, uh, demonstrating good stewardship of our resources by, uh, by living according to a plan. So I think that's, for me, that's where it starts is with a, with a budget, not just a budget that says I'm going to give and I'm going to save, but how am I going to spend and utilize the other 80%. Uh, I'm going to steal what Pastor Nathan's probably going to say. Uh, <laughs> Part of it, I would say margin, uh, living within margin, you know, having a budget, being able to do that because we all know that a lot of arguments can come from finances. Uh, and when you're not living in that margin, that's where the strain and the stress comes from, where it's going to go, whether it be a budget, 
Uh, I can say this is somewhere that me and Jennifer should probably do better at. Um, I don't spend money, but when I do, it's a lot. <laughs> and, and we've talked about doing a, uh, an allowance, mainly for me, to be honest. Uh, and I've not done it because there's always other things I want to do. But um, I, I think that's a big thing is living in that margin, um, knowing that you have some breathing room. And that's going to be different from, you know, everybody. Uh, and if you're married, you know, having good conversations about it, um, what your goals are, what your financial goals are. Um, you know, being able to go out to lunch at Sunday with the group, if that's what you choose to do. Um, you know, me and Jennifer don't eat out a lot, honestly, because we don't value that. It's a lot when you have a family of five and y'all that have seen Riley, he's not small. Uh, and he can eat more than me. <laughs> so, and Simeon's coming right along with that. Um, so just knowing that margin and what you value in that money, I think that helps a lot. Hey, Nathan, will you add to that incorporating the Holy Spirit into the decisions? Yeah. Remember, take it from me. Okay, um, I would say a, a couple of things. I was going to say margin. That's right, Kyle. The, uh, and I would say margin in two ways. Margin in your overall budget, although you budget out every dollar every month, but you budget in margin, okay? And so it's not that I budget out 90% and then I have 10% margin. No, you budget out 100%, but there is, you know, you can use categories of margin, but not just margin for yourself. I would say having margin for generosity, uh, in your budget is a good thing. Um, but I think to, to better answer the question, you almost have to know, okay, where are you at in your financial journey right now? Because then here's the next step. Um, and some of those steps might be that if you um, don't, uh, 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 don't give at all, start to give uh, a percentage amount. Maybe you're not ready for 10, but you might start at five. Uh, and, and then if you do give on a percentage basis, go to 10. If you're, if you're at 10, begin to place tithes and offerings on top of that. If you're not saving now, begin to save. You know, so it depends on kind of where you're at in that journey. If you are saving, uh, you do have a three to six month emergency fund set aside, then you want to be thinking about kids' college or, or retirement or paying off your house or you know, other things. And so really it depends on where you're at uh, in the process would determine that next kind of step to know uh, how you're stewarding it. But I think just constantly moving forward, some of the guys in ministry that I admire the most uh, have big financial goals. And for instance, I, I think it's uh, Bill Johnson who says his, uh, his financial goal right now is to live off of 10% of his income and to give away 90 and I'm like, man, that's such a convicting goal that I'd be able to live in such generosity. Uh, and, and as a result, of course, he's blessed, right? And, and, and he, he probably, I know because he writes books and, and does you know, a lot of stuff and whatever, but he, he lives a very blessed life, but he's constantly giving away ahead of the, the increase of blessing. And so I think that's very admirable. But I think also with the Holy Spirit, I think being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and being sensitive to what God um, is is asking you to do financially because we can set out a financial plan that says, you know, you tithe 10%, you save 10%, you set aside an emergency fund, you begin to pay, you snowball your debts, you do all of those different things. But sometimes the Holy Spirit comes along and says, I want you to do this and I want you to trust me. And you're going, well, that's not in my plan, Holy Spirit. You know what? Why would I do that? That doesn't make sense for me financially. But what I've always found is when, the, when God asks us to do something financial, it's oftentimes because he's waiting to, to, to bring in a blessing or do something for us that we would not have been able to do by ourselves. And, and when we become obedient and we kind of step out of the steps, um, uh, then, then when God blesses us, oftentimes it accelerates the steps. And so I think that's just so cool how the Holy Spirit works that way. This feels like a part two to this question, and Riley asks, aside from giving tithes, how do you know if God wants you to give? Say that again? So you've already tithed. How do you know when God wants you to give besides that? I think you just have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm not a big person that will just hand out money to somebody begging on the street, um, but I can tell you that there's been times that God said, go give him this. And I don't know if it was so much for me or that person. I honestly, and think in that instance, it was for me more the Holy Spirit, Spirit saying if I was going to be obedient. 
and doing what I was asked to do uh, and what God has trusted me with that. You know, speak to your spouse, your loved ones. Make sure that you're both being obedient. When, when something comes up, if Jennifer comes to me and says, hey, I think we should do X, Y, and Z, sometimes it's boom, instant. I'm like, oh, we should give this. Or other times I'm like, eh, let me chew on it a minute. So, you know, use, use your partner in that uh, to just be sensitive and, and just make sure that you take yourself out of the equation um, because everybody's going through something sometime. So, you know, just be sensitive. I would say always be stretching that muscle and, and uh, always be um, uh, kind of adjusting or adapting your financial goals. It's like our financial goals every year, one of them is to always be more generous than the previous year. And so last year we gave uh, 10% in tithes and offerings. Let's, let's say, you know, we did. But let, and then maybe we gave an additional 5% or 10% in tithes. We gave an additional 5% in offerings. And maybe next year we'll do 6% or 7% or 8%, whatever the Lord. Uh, of course, we'll ask Holy Spirit about it. But, but even if we feel like the Holy Spirit's not saying anything, Specifically, then we'll just take it up a percentage or we'll take it up to, uh, we'll take a next step and always just make sure that we're growing in that area. Um, I think that's incredibly valuable and very important. Just, just keep growing in that area because you can't outgive God, right? Like he, it's not like if you make it all the way up to 90% someday because of, you know, the blessing of God in your life or whatever, that all of a sudden, you know, you're just gonna, it's gonna fall through for you finally, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't work that way. It never does. So. One thing for Nathan and I as well is if we feel like the Holy Spirit's leading us to give, um, we will ask each other an amount. And typically speaking, it's going to be the same amount. And we'll say it out loud together. And we know that we know it's time to give. If we... Yeah, if we get the same number, <laughs> we know that was the Lord, right? <laughs> you know, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to say real quick was uh, just understand, I think there's this biblical principle. We think that when we're tithing, we're being generous. Tithing is not generosity. Tithing is obedience. Tithing is the baseline. Tithing is, and we talked about tithing in week three, and you can go back and watch the message online. But tithing is the baseline for obedience. Generosity starts above that. And so it's important to understand that uh, a lot of times we call our obedience generous. And no, I'm, I'm just being obedient to my father. And, and then on top of that, he asked me to be generous. And so growing in that. So speaking of tithes, uh, can you tithe multiple places or does all of your tithe need to go to one place? (laughs) Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Um, Well, the tithe, I I think Nathan just just described it very well. Tithe is that first 10%. That's obedience. Anything beyond that is is offerings. You can give... You know, we give beyond the ten percent that we give to to Ridgeline, and that's. I hope that we all will grow to be generous like that, and I grow can grow my generosity. Uh, but I believe that um, uh, that our first ten percent should go to to the local church, and specifically the church that we're a part of. Um, you know, that's uh, we need to invest in in the the local ministry, and uh, so I feel pretty passionate about that the first the tithes should go to the to the church and then we like i said we give to i give to the organization that i'm a part of we give to other organizations and but that's beyond the tithe i agree with tony the only thing i would add there is and this is my opinion um i I think as believers we have to be careful having a closed fist and when you release that money, it is no longer your money. Whether you agree with what's going on, uh, whether you give to somebody that's in missions or you're giving your 10% to the church that you're attending, that is no longer your funds. It's, it's you're being obedient. You're doing what the Holy Spirit's asking you to do. Um, so you need to release it. And I've just been involved with a few churches before and you hear people speak and, well, I don't like this and I don't like that. That's not your position. You have to trust God and knowing what he's doing with those funds, whether it be to ministry or to wherever it's going. Um, I, I'm just encouraging everybody not to be, not to rob your own blessing. 
I guess would be the, the safeguard. And, and listen, I'm talking to myself because there's been times that me and Jennifer have given to people in missions and I'm like, I don't like that. I don't agree. No. Why are they raising funds? Why don't they just go get a job? And that's, that is my, that's Kyle's flesh. That's my problem. So I'm speaking to myself in that as well. Uh, I was thinking about this recently. A, a good analogy for this would be if you, the the kind of if you were to take that question and put it anywhere else, it just doesn't. It almost doesn't make sense. And of course, biblically, you know, like Kyle and and Tony have both said that I think the biblical obligation is that the the tithe goes to the local church. And I feel like answering this is a bit of a conflict of interest. But but it, just hear my heart. Um, and that is, you know, I wouldn't go out to eat at one restaurant and then try to pay to pay the split the bill up and pay it at multiple different restaurants. You know, you know I just, I wouldn't do that. Uh, this is my local church. This is where uh, my kids get taken care of, where my family gets ministered from. This is where uh, we are growing up as a family. This is, the, this is the church where we are challenged and stretched and where we grow and where we get to be a part of the church that ministers to us. And so we tithe here. And tithing is the... Um, is the system that God set up to finance the local church. And so that, that's why I believe, like, like Tony and Kyle both said, that, that it is the biblical, uh, you know, the biblical definition of tithing is your local church. Looks like we have time for one more question. Okay. All right. So because there is poverty in the world, should we feel okay with spending money at all? Because there's poverty in the world, is it okay to spend money at all? No. Next question. <laughs> uh, I'm assuming that when they say any money at all on things that other people, especially people that are living in poverty, would consider frivolous, um, uh, my answer would be it is okay. Um, if everything else is is in order, we've talked a lot about... Uh, um, you know, laying a good foundation, uh, modeling for our kids and, and setting a budget and all that. If I've done that before the Lord and I am, and Kyle made a good point about holding loose, don't hold on with a tight fist, but hold loosely under those resources God blesses us with. Um, you know, God sometimes wants to bless his children and, uh, you know, sometimes he does that through tangible ways. Um, it could be experiences. It could be things that, that we spend money on. We're going to, um, you know, this Christmas, we're going to buy gifts and give those to, to family members and loved ones and our kids. And, uh, and I think it's fine to do that. And that's one of the ways that we can show the love of Christ and the model, the generosity of Christ is by being a blessing to others. But so I think it's fine to, to, um, uh, to spend money. Uh, but, you know, not if it's costing us our generosity towards others, uh, and and I think we've already heard some some great words on that. The um, um, you know, uh, I've heard I, when in the spring when COVID hit and the economy shut down, and um, you know, thankfully I was in a spot. Kim and I were in a spot where we did not uh, we were we we're not uh, greatly impacted by that. And um, and yet we got a stimulus check just like everybody else. And uh, our first thought was not, oh, we can go buy a TV or we can go buy. It was, um, you know, how can we use this to, to be a blessing to others who aren't in the same position of us, who might be hurting right now. And I think, um, uh, you know, so there's a balance there. And if you have that, the other stuff in order, if you're tithing, if you're, if you're being generous, giving above your tithe, if you're saving uh, for your financial future and the future of your children. As Nathan has challenged us early in the series, uh, leaving a financial legacy and a financial blessing for, for uh, the generations to follow, then I think it, you know, God does bless us with those, those, uh, the opportunity to do some things for ourselves as well. I think also, just to piggyback off that a little bit, is <clears throat> how you're looking at money or things. Um, Money shouldn't be an idol to you. Anything you put before the Lord is is not good. Um, I actually got rid of a vehicle one time, and this is not a pat on my back, but it, it become tight-fisted. And it was one of those things that, you know, I needed to get rid of it just because it held the wrong place in my life. And anything can do that. 
And if you don't have those things in order, whether it be money or vehicles or a house, um, I, I think you have to look at where where that's at when it comes to, you know, your budget and what goals you're trying to have. Uh, I think, I, th- I feel like, and I don't know who asked the question, and, and so I all, all due respect, I feel like the, the question has a faulty premise um, in this is first and foremost, uh, let's say I were to give away everything because there are other poor people in the world. I, I would not probably be solved. Like where my income level is at, it would solve nobody's problems. Uh, first and foremost. Second, secondly, it, it's not my responsibility to steward the finances for somebody else. It's my responsibility to steward my finances for me and my family first and foremost. Now, again, I'm not talking about don't be generous or don't listen to the Holy Spirit or don't uh, be obedient. And, you know, I'm not talking about any of those things. When the Holy Spirit says give to somebody, you give. Or when the Holy Spirit says, you know, invest in this missions organization or this missionary or this person or this homeless guy or this, you know, shelter, whatever, then, then you definitely do that. But what I would say with that feeling one is, I think sometimes we feel like money solves problems that aren't financial problems. And while people are poor, oftentimes, or, or in need, oftentimes finances or money, cash specifically, are not the answer to those problems. There are other issues uh, that need to be addressed and need to be dealt with, and, and we need to, and if, uh, you know, if that person is going to... Uh, uh, set up a good financial future, then, then they need help in other ways as well. And so, but, but the lastly, I would say, if that is a passion of yours, then, uh, then, then that, be careful not to put that obligation on other people. Um, that's your passion. And what I would do is say, God, I'm really passionate about poor people. And I just feel like everybody should give to the poor and and nobody should, you know, have really nice things or whatever, because, you know, I'm just passionate about poor people and say, obviously, God, I'm not responsible for however, but how everybody else spends their money uh, or, or uh, I'm, I'm only responsible to steward what I'm given. Um, but what, what do you want me to do with this passion? Do you want me to start something? Should I be investing in homeless ministries in our community? What, what do you want me to do with this? Because I can't just go around judging everybody else for the way they spend their finances. Um, and so I think understanding a couple of those things is really, really important when it comes to dealing with finances. And there was, there was one other thing that I was thinking about uh, specifically for this. Um, and if it comes to me, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to it. But I think we've got time for one or two more. All we're, right. we're doing good. This is a, a really good, straightforward question. Oh, um, here it is. I got it. Go for it. The, so the, the issue with that is we all self-define our own needs, okay? And so when we self-define our own needs, we spend, you know, X amount of our budget on what we define as our needs. And, and what, where we draw the line between people who have too much and people who don't have enough is our own line. And so people who have more than us, they have too much. I'm not rich, they're rich. And, and, and what I promise you is that as that line moves for you, your definition moves with it. It doesn't change. You never become the rich person. <laughs> you move with that line. And it's always the people who make more than you that make too much, or they're the greedy ones, or they have things that they don't need. And the people that have less than me, far less than me, they're the ones that, that must need something. And let me tell you, there's a lot of people, all, and I've been all, I've, I've been in probably not as much as Tony, but I've lived in different places in the world. I, I, I'm not born here in the U.S. I've lived in the Caribbean islands. There are people who live well on way less than you and I would make in the United States. They don't need our finances. Right, they, they don't have financial issues uh, uh, just because they make less than we do, and, and you know what? There are people who are way in worse financial issues and problems uh, that make way more than we do because they've made bad decisions or or they're in debt over you know uh, up to their ears or or whatever. And so we need to be careful what we define as you know. Well, anything more than what I buy for myself that's that's excessive. And anybody who has less than what I have, they must be poor. And so they must need something. And so we got to be careful with that line and what that looks like and understand that, man, we are, like, I, I my wife and I make more money uh, in our 30s than we did in our 20s, right? 
and, uh, uh, and, and hopefully in our 40s we'll make more than we did in our 30s, you know. And, and so there, there is this moving line of, well, you know, if, if let's say we make, you know, I don't know, 10 times more in our 40s than we made in our 20s, uh, then we would have in our 20s said, man, that would be, we, we would be rich, you know. But then we get there and we go, well, this, I don't feel rich. I don't feel like, you know, I just can go buy whatever I want or I can do whatever I want. And the definition of rich is this moving target. So we have to be very, very careful uh, that we don't make ourselves the line of anybody past us is rich, anybody below us is, is in poverty or poor. Good job. <laughs> wow. So this question is on claiming ties on taxes at the end of the year. What is your perspective, healthy or unhealthy? Claiming ties or claiming your with your yeah, definitely. Definitely what? Healthy or unhealthy? Oh, oh definitely healthy. Use any IRS tax law that's available. <laughs> it's not our rule. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's uh, uh, it would be unwise not to take advantage of the laws on the books, the the tax law on the books, and uh, I mean the the even the church as an organization, the organization I I'm part of, we are uh, designated nonprofit organizations, and there's tax benefits that come with that tax. Uh, um, and so I would say, you know, um, we part of being a good steward is taking advantage of those uh, deductions that, and that hopefully helps us to be even more generous with what God has blessed us with. All right, that was a quick yeah. one. We'll do another one. Kyle added, but be honest about it. Yes, don't cheat on your taxes. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> How do you enjoy the gift of wealth while ensuring it doesn't become your identity? I'll have to get back to you in 10 or 20 years. <laughs> I think, again, it becoming your identity or it becoming an idol. Um, my brother was telling me about a gentleman that he knows, so this is far removed. None of us would know him. Um, he made lower six figures in his salary, constant tither, da 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 his business exploded within about a year. He started making north of a million dollars a year. I think we all can agree that's pretty good. I wouldn't be mad at all. (laughs) Um, But he went to his pastor and he started having trouble tithing and giving based on his new income. I think part of that is probably his paradigm, you know, his own, like Nathan was saying, Pastor Nathan was saying, him moving that line and that line being moved so quickly. But he went to his pastor and said, hey, you know, what do I need to do? And he said, well, why are you having trouble with it? And the gentleman said, well, my tithe and giving would be more than I used to make in a year. And the pastor said, well, you were a good steward before. Do you feel like you were blessed? You know, obviously I don't know the whole conversation. And the gentleman ended up asking the pastor, will you please pray that I will have the courage and the ability to start doing this? And the pastor said, no. He said, I'm going to pray that God takes you back down to what level you were comfortable with and that you were able to tithe. I mean, obviously the man was not happy, but that's where we have to remove ourselves. That's my first thing I said about your percentage as you're earning that income, make it a percentage. So as you grow, it grows, whether it be savings or tithing or anything. Um, But obviously that man, his, his own connotation on that money and the amount that was going to the church, he couldn't wrap his head around it. And I think that was, I don't want to say it was an idol because I don't know him, but, you know, that was his own flesh not being able to do that. So when it comes to money, it's not ours anyway. It's all God's, all of it, everything that we have. It's not, it can be here and gone in an instant and none of it matters, but you have to be able to understand that. We have word the question. How do you enjoy the gift of wealth while ensuring it doesn't become your identity? Gain wealth? Is that what you said? How do you get the gift of wealth? Oh, the the gift. Gift of wealth. Yeah. Mm. yeah, the 
it starts, well, Nathan even mentioned early in the series, I'm going to butcher my paraphrase of it, but uh, um, uh, you know, God blesses us according to our, our ability to steward, something along that line. And, Sounds uh, like me. Yeah, and then as we, um, as we you know, uh, God give, tests us and we prove ourselves faithful in stewarding ways, then he blesses us a little bit more. And, um, but it starts out at those lower levels and realizing that 100% of what we have is God's. It's all from him. He is our source. He's our provider. He may not be the signature on our paycheck, but it's all from him. And I think if we recognize that with when we, when we have uh, more modest income, uh, that prepares us for more significant income. And when we realize that 100% of it is, is God's, and he asks us to give 10% back and then to steward well the, the remaining 90%, um, it doesn't matter whether it's a little or it's a lot. I think we've uh, we we have the right mindset at that point that it's uh, uh, it's all God's and I'm going to use this in a way that's pleasing to Him and if I'm doing that then I can I can enjoy uh, a bit of uh, financial freedom because I am being a good steward of what I have so if I um, you know it, it, the um, you know, for the first uh, uh, almost year that Kim and I lived here, we lived in a in a uh, three bedroom apartment with five of us, and and now we have a pretty good sized house, and um, and I see that house as a gift from God, and so I don't feel guilt about it. I don't feel uh, that um, we're we're overspending in any ways. It's within our budget, and um, it's uh, and really recognizing that it it's not mine, it's God's, and I have to steward that just like I do anything else. I think that's, for me, that's where it starts, is recognize it's not mine in the first place, it's God's, and I'm going to try to use everything, all that, whether it's wealth or any other um, blessing he pours out on me as such. You also use that as a, you're very generous with open doors of church events and things like that so it's yeah with their house yeah yeah Yeah. uh one is there are several scripture verses that talk about this specifically and uh and and god is really and again like we've talked about probably every week of the series is that god doesn't need our money he wants our heart and our wallet and our our money is so personal to us that that he says you know what if i'm going to get their heart then i'm going to have to i'm going to have to have this line where the direct connection to their wallet as well and, and that way they don't make an idol out of their finances and so i think there's this um this there's this direct connection between our wallet and our heart and god doesn't need our wallet but he wants our heart and so Understanding some of the scriptures and some of the things scripture talks about when it comes to stewarding and how finances can wreck a person uh, when they get out of priority or they get out of the right position in our hearts. And that's why, and gen, so generosity is the antidote to keeping your finances in the right place. And when you start to feel like, oh, I'm clenching onto something too tight, it might be like Kyle talked about, it might be time to get rid of that thing. Uh, uh, it, it might be time to, you know, look, I, I feel like I'm holding on to my finances too tightly. I, I'm going to give uh, $100 to the first uh, five homeless people I see because I, I need to get this thing out. I need to pull this thing out from the roots. I don't need this thing to live inside of me anymore. I'm not giving this any place. I remember a great story. A lot of us know John Maxwell as the great leadership guru and the author of multiple, you know, New York Times bestsellers. But a lot of us, you may not know, John Maxwell was a lead pastor uh, for several years. And he had a very wealthy man in his, I think he was a Presbyterian pastor in his church, come up to him. They didn't like something that was going on in, in the church. And so he's, he told the pastor, uh, I, I've, this is my tithe check, but I'm not going to give it today because I don't like this. And so John Maxwell just looks at him very graciously and says, uh, hey, do you mind if we pray together about this? And so uh, he says, yes. And so he says, just repeat after me, dear Lord Jesus, I've decided to rob you today. I've decided, no. <laughs> and you got to have this, this understanding, like, like both of the gentlemen have said, this is not ours. We are stewards. It's all his. And I'm just so grateful that God only requires 10% because he could require it all. But he allows us to manage the rest. And of course, we need to do it in a way that's honoring to him. So awesome. That's so good, guys. Can you guys give our panel a round of applause? Then they do great. Thanks, guys. Yeah, you guys are good to go. I appreciate it. I'm going to close the service.